Hey, what's going on, AP government people? We have chapter eight for you today of government in America. This one is on political parties. We're going to go back in time a little bit, do a little recap of history. It's going to be a good chapter. All right, let's start off talking about what is a political party. It is people that are trying to win office and control the government. And usually these people belong to one of two parties in present day America. Now we're going to talk about party in the electorate, which is the idea that any American can be a member of any party at any time. Unlike European countries, there are no membership cards or dues that are required. So if I want to declare that I am a Democrat today, I can do that. And if tomorrow I want to declare that I'm a Republican, I can do that as well. Now parties as an organization have national and local offices and staff. So there really are local or county or state organizations and national organizations as well for political parties. And the, when we're talking about party and the government, we're talking about those individuals that are elected. So what are the tasks or the goals or the, the programs of the policy of the parties? Well, first and foremost, they're a linkage institution. And that's a vocab word we talked about in chapter one, which is a way that people's concerns help become political issues. So parties are very receptive to people's concerns and they usually try to address those as a way to get elected. Political parties also help decide candidates. Presidential nominees are chosen by the public. It, didn't, it wasn't always this way. It used to be that they were nominated at a convention by party members, but today they're chosen by the public. They run campaigns on all levels, whether it's local, state, or federal government, and they provide information to the public about certain policies and the way that the party is being run. And they articulate policies via platforms. And these platforms are broad goals or ideas that the parties have for the state or country. And they can also coordinate policy making between the legislative and executive branches. So political parties play a very influential role in discussions between the executive and legislative branches, especially when those two branches are dominated by different political parties. So let's go to something called rational choice theory. And this theory states that voters want their policies to be adopted by the government and parties want to win elections. So under this theory, parties will do their best to adopt policies that voters want. It doesn't always work out the way, but that's the idea of this. Most Americans identify themselves as centrist or just to one side or the other of the middle. So most Americans don't see themselves as ex in extreme forms as conservative or liberal. Rather, they see themselves more as moderates and they may be leaning one way towards conservatives or liberals. And parties with extreme ideas are rarely successful. And you need to look no further than the 2012 presidential election when the Prohibition Party received 519 votes in that election. That is an extreme idea, the Prohibition Party. Forgetting the fact that that idea failed before, that is an extreme idea that is not very successful. Okay, let's go to party image. This is the idea that individuals have a certain image of each political party. So they view Democrats in one way and they view Republicans in another way. Party identification is the preference for a party and most voters vote for candidates of the party they identify with. So voters may not know something about a specific candidate, but if they see the D or the R next to their name, they most likely will vote for them if they support that party. Ticket splitting is the idea that voters vote for one party for an office. So say, for example, they may vote for Democratic for the president, but then they'll vote for Republicans for the legislative branch or maybe an office in their own state. And this occurs most often with independence, this idea of ticket splitting. This is becoming more and more popular. We see this a lot. And, and looking back since Nixon, very rarely has the presidency and the legislative branch been dominated by both political parties. Okay, local parties, we're talking about your city or county parties. These are have been historically party machines, and these are organizations that would reward members in some way, shape, or form, and they would rely on ethnic support. Think of the Irish in Tammany Hall of the 1800s, and most often they would use patronage. Now, you may ask yourself, what is patronage? Well, hopefully you remember from U.S. history, patronage is giving jobs to political supporters, and that was used by Boss Tweed to an extreme, and he was um, the, the head of Tammany Hall in New York City during the 1800s. This has since been replaced by the merit system, or usually you have to take a test, civil service exam, which you have to take a test and prove your worth as a government employee. 
parties in the states. States decide election procedures for political parties. They decide whether a primary is going to be an open primary or a closed primary. An open primary is the idea that any voter can participate in the primary, whether they are a member of that political party or not. I live in New York State and we have a closed primary. So in order to vote for the Democratic nominee for president or the Republican nominee for president, you have to be a registered member of that party. National party organizations host the national convention every four years and they write the party's platform. The national committee runs the party between conventions and they may, and it is made up of representatives from the states. And the national chairperson is the one who hires staff and takes care of day-to-day -day business of the party. And this is done every day, not just every four years like the national convention. So you need to understand this term coalition. A coalition is, an, is a group of individuals that support the party based on the party's track record. And this can and does often change based on the fulfillment of promises. So when LBJ said in 1964 that he would not send Americans to Vietnam, there was one coalition. Years later, when that increased, there was a different coalition that was supporting him. President George H.W. Bush repeatedly campaigned in 1988 that he would not raise taxes. He said, read my lips, no new taxes. When he went back on that campaign promise, there was a that coalition shifted. Now, more often than not, presidential platforms meet many of the promises of the campaigns. Of course, it's nearly impossible to meet every promise, but more often than not, that does happen. An example is Bill Clinton's gun control law, the Brady Bill that he signed in, and the second Bush, George W. Bush, he promised tax cuts in 2000, in the 2000 campaign, and that did happen in 2001, 2002. So let's talk about party eras in American history. So we're going to go back in time a little bit and examine this two-party system. And really throughout American history, America has been dominated by two political parties, even though Washington warned of political parties in his farewell address. So from 1796 to 1824, we have the first party system. On one end, we had the Federalists led by Alexander Hamilton. And on the other end, we had the Democratic Republicans led by Jefferson. In 1828 to 1856, we have the present day Democrats emerge and their counterparts were the Whigs. During Andrew Jackson's presidency, the Democratic Party was born. And on the opposing side, we see the Whigs. Now, many voting requirements were eliminated for adult white males during Jackson's presidency. So we actually see a rise in democracy. Property requirements were eliminated. We, Martin Van Buren was the architect of the Democratic Party. So if somebody were to ask you who is the founder of the, the present day Democratic Party, most people give Andrew Jackson credit for it. But the real mastermind was this guy, Martin Van Buren and his sweet, sweet sideburns. Then when we're talking about the Whigs, we're talking about my boy, Henry Clay. If you took AP U.S. History last year, you cannot escape him. He is back in AP government. He formed the Whigs in opposition to Andrew Jackson. Huh? I bet you missed this guy so much. So from 1860 to 1928, jumping ahead, we have the two Republican eras where Republicans really dominated the federal government. The Republican Party formed in the 1850s. They opposed the expansion of slavery. And that was really their, their main platform prior to the Civil War. Then after the Civil War, they began to favor high tariffs, internal improvements, and the gold standard. And high tariffs and internal improvements, that sounds a lot like Henry Clay's American system. 1932 to 1964, we have what is called the New Deal Coalition. And the Great Depression, the New Deal shifted party loyalties significantly. And Democrats favored increased government involvement in the economy. And this is a huge shift because the Great Depression is going on during this time. So we have the New Deal coalition. New Deal, you think of Franklin Roosevelt. That was his plan to try to help America get out of the Great Depression. And during this time, those that began to vote Democratic included those living in cities, those that were members of unions, poor individuals and blacks. It's very important to understand that blacks began to vote in large numbers for the Democrats, beginning with the election of FDR forever. They predominantly voted Republican. They were loyal to the party of Lincoln, but with the New Deal, they began to switch to, Demo to the Democratic Party. The Great Society, which was LBJ's idea, this continued ideas of the New Deal and added civil rights legislation. Now, from 1968 to the present, we see a Southern realignment, 
in which most often a single party does not control the White House and both houses of Congress. And we begin to sh see a shift from Democrats being the solid South to Republicans being more popular in the South. And political dealignment is the idea that many people are moving away from the two political parties. Okay, so let's jump on over to third parties and examine their impact on American politics. There are three main types of third parties. One is those that promote a certain cause. Maybe they're pro-life, maybe they're prohibition, something along those lines. Two is a splinter party that is a split from a major party. So Teddy Roosevelt split from the Republicans in 1912 and ran on the Bull Moose Party. And the third one is based on an individual hoping to be president. You saw this in 1992 and 1996 with H. Ross Perot, who was running for president. This party was really built around just Ross Perot, the central figure. Often, the two parties do not take a stand on controversial issues because they fear of losing many voters. If they do, they could alienate a good portion of the population. So oftentimes, the two parties just play it safe. So there's this idea of the responsible party model, which is the idea that a majority party would implement its programs and all members of the party would be united with that program, no matter what it is. The minority party would let the public know what it would do if it were in power. And the majority party is responsible for the actions of the government. And if the government is successful, then the majority party would get all the credit for it. And if the government is not successful, then the majority party would take all the blame for it. Not one reason we don't see this in America is not all party members always agree on platforms. For instance, Southern Democrats tend to be more fiscally conservative than their counterparts in the North. The South tends to be a more fiscally conservative area. So you will see Southern Democrats be more likely to vote against increases in spending than Northern Democrats. All right, let's do a quick recap. Linkage institutions definitely know that definition. It comes from chapter one as well. Ticket splitting is the idea of voting for people from the two different political parties. Party machines, it's a recap from US history. Patronage is giving jobs to those to government supporters. New Deal Coalition changed the way that changed the New Deal Coalition changed the makeup of Democrats, especially for African Americans. And be familiar with the three different types of third of third parties. All right, that is everything you need to know for this chapter. Thank you guys very much for watching. If you have not already, please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. Help me spread the word. If you found this video helpful, please share it with somebody in your class or a friend or somebody who could benefit from it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the section below. I appreciate you guys watching and have a good day.